Well, the sun didn't shine. Down on Cal Calvary's mountain. Well, the sun didn't shine. Oh, no. Well, the next bit is very gentle. We, we contour along. And the one thing to be careful about is the coast to coast walk goes off to the right. But our, so don't, please don't take that unless you want to go to St. Bede. Well, the sun didn't shine. Down on Cal Calvary's mountain. Well, the sun didn't shine. Oh, no. It's great gable, partly because Richard's wonderful book on mountains, whose cover alone is, is a thing of great beauty and its contents are uh, uh, you know, even more wonderful, uh, is, is a mountain, so we thought we'd better find a mountain. Uh, the book I've done is a book of con Guardian Country Diaries written during wartime and um, you are now on top of the biggest war memorial in Britain and somewhere around here, is, uh, around there, it's worth having a look at the plaque um, in memory of the members of the Fell and Rock Club who died in the First World War and the Fell and Rock Club bought Great Gable and the surrounding fells and then gave them to the nation and they're in the care of the National Trust um, as a gift in memory of the fallen. So it's a very good place, I think. Um, to launch these books and this is the fifth book launch we've had and we've never had anything remotely approaching this number of people so um, thank you very very much for making it so successful the organisation of this I think um, thank you ever so much anyway it's called Cigarettes as an Aid to High Climbing oh yes <laughs> November the 21st 1922 Captain J.J. J. Finch who took part in the Mount Everest expedition speaking at the meeting of the Royal Geographical Society in London last evening on the equipment for high climbing, testified to the comfort of cigarette smoking at high altitude. <laughs> he said that he, he and two other members of the expedition camped at 25,000 feet for over 26 hours, and all that time they used no oxygen. <coughs> About half an hour after arrival, he noticed in a very marked fashion that unless he kept his mind on the question of breathing, making it a voluntary process instead of an involuntary <laughs> one, he suffered from lack of air. He had 30 cigarettes with him, and as a measure of desperation, he lit one. <laughs> After deeply inhaling the smoke, he and his companions found they could take their mind off the question of breathing altogether. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the smoke acted as an irritant and took the place of carbon dioxide in which the blood was deficient at these high altitudes. The effect of a cigarette lasted at least three hours. When the supply of cigarettes was exhausted, they had recourse to oxygen, which enabled them to have their first sleep at this great altitude. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you should know that he ran the combustion group at Imperial College. Really? <laughs> a very famous scientist who ended up in heading the National Chemical Laboratory of Pune. How interesting. Anyway, that's a, a digression. <laughs> that was the same man who... <laughs> yes, yes. I think that's a big round of applause. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, as Richard said, you know, the, the, these books are fantastically rich in content, not because of anything we've done, but because we're using the material of marvellous writers. And, and it's particularly nice with the Country Diary because none of them are famous, really. I suppose Harry Griffin, possibly, certainly in this part of the world, is well known, but th th they are, in inverted commas, ordinary people with terrific powers of observation. Um, but they're just one or two, very quickly. Uh, this one's been used before in, in the. In the um, the book of a hundred years but um, Arnold Boyd who was a great bird man writing uh, in September 1939 what happened in September 1939 class <laughs> <laughs> who can tell me <laughs> nobody <laughs> no. the, the, the second world war started well done <laughs> Judy top of the class Judy. I wasn't there. No. and Arnold Boyd <clears throat> on the day said, I cannot help thinking that if only Hitler had been an ornithologist, he would have put off the war until the autumn bird migration. <laughs> <laughs> um, during the war, um, metal was taken by the government and most of it was just dumped in the English Channel um, because it was a, it was a sort of um, morale boosting thing. Um, but the, the aluminium they did use to make aeroplanes with and um, there's a little poem here by um, a housewife which starts, um, my saucepans have all been surrendered, the teapot is gone from the hob, the colander's leaving the cabbage for a very much different job. <laughs> it sounds like Pam <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Sorry, Doug, I'm not yeah, really good. You sound like Pam <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, so now, when I hear on the wireless of hurricanes showing their metal, the hurricane being a British uh, fighter aircraft, I see in a vision before me a Dornier, which is a German bomber. So I better read that verse again, having explained it. <laughs> so now, when I hear on the wireless of hurricanes showing their metal, I see in a vision before me a Dornier chased by my kettle. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's, it's a positive. Um, how much does it cost? It's, it's, it's well worth every. <laughs> Well, the sun didn't shine Down on Calvary's Cal 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 mountain Well, the sun didn't shine Down on Calvary's Cal mountain Well, the sun didn't shine Down on Calvary's Cal mountain When my Lord was dying on the cross Well, the sun didn't shine Down on Calvary's Cal 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 mountain Well, the sun didn't shine